discuss for a minute or two the homework problem, um, which I know is challenging, and I'm glad that you guys are getting the opportunity to work such a challenging problem. I think it's, I think it's fun. It's good. So, voltage and current dividers, lecture three, four. So we already did voltage dividers with resistor circuits, right? Um, but we're going to now generalize that and look at uh, uh, voltage dividers with any impedance elements. So uh, we'll also introduce a current divider as well. So the current divider uh, will be analogous to the voltage divider, uh, but will work for current sources and elements in parallel instead of with uh, the voltage divider, which is uh, voltage, source, and elements in series. So we will uh, see those as well. So voltage dividers, though. First, we develop a solution for the two-element voltage divider shown in figure 3.3. Three. <clears throat> so here we've got uh, some element Z1. I didn't uh, choose a specific element because it could be a resistor or a capacitor or an inductor. It just has impedance Z1, okay? And uh, uh, an element Z2 in series with it. Um, and we're going to choose the output voltage to be the voltage across Z2. So this is our output voltage. Uh, V2. So the analysis can follow our usual methodology of six steps solving for V2. And we're going to analyze the circuit, find out what the output voltage is, and recognize, oh, the circuit shows up a lot, so we can just skip to the answer with these voltage divider circuits. We don't have to go through all the steps every time. So we'll do it once, and then we don't have to do it every time. That's what we're going to do. All the steps now, so we don't have to do them next time. So the circuit diagram is given. Our sign convention is already, is already uh, given to us. We have to choose those directions, because that's the direction I1 is pointed, so and I2 is pointed. So we've got drops across Z1 and Z2 in those directions. And step three, the elemental equations are just generalized Ohm's law, right? Always with impedance elements. So element one, element two, we've got that V1 equals I1, Z1. And uh, V2 equals I2, Z2. We don't know what Z1 and Z2 are at this point, right? So, well, actually, at no point. We're not going to actually specify what they are. But typically, we would write Z1 equals and Z2 equals at this point. Since we don't have a specific element, we can't do that. The KCL equation, Kirchhoff's current law, can be found looking at, so we could look at each of the nodes, but two of them, these two, are connected to the voltage source, right? So we don't typically write a KCL formula or equation for that type of node. This node, though, is not connected to a voltage source. So we can see that the current going in is I1 and the current going out is I2. So I1 equals I2. And KVL is our next step. Go around the loop. There's only one loop. Um, and see that VS is equal to V1 plus V2. And as usual, we have a set of Equations and unknowns, so four unknowns, four equations, but we only really care about V out, right? The 
the uh, V2, the voltage output. So we're going to aim at that one. We're going to try to solve for V2. Um, in the first step, let's eliminate I2 and V1 from uh, using the KCL and KVL equations and, and substituting them into equations uh, 1 and 2. So we'll rewrite 1 and 2. If we eliminate V1, that means that um, we can solve this for I1, for instance. So I1 equals uh, V1 over Z1, which V1 is just from KVL, Vs minus V2, right? still divided by Z1. And the other equation, we're going to eliminate I2. So we know that I2 is just equal to I1 from KCL, so we can do that pretty easily. V2 equals I1 Z2. So it's pretty easy to eliminate I1 now and be left just with V2 if we take the first equation and substitute it into the second equation. So we have that V2 equals Vs minus V2 uh, times Z2 divided by Z1. Okay. What do we think? Solve for V2. There's V2 on both sides, right? So we got to solve for V2. And V2 is equal to Z2 over Z1 plus Z2 times Vs. So this is our output voltage, right? And it has our input voltage multiplied by a fraction. Uh, Z2 over Z1 plus Z2. Does this look like the resistor voltage divider? Yeah. So if those two impedances are just resistors, this is just R2 over R1 plus R2, and we're just looking at the old voltage divider circuit. So it's, it's, it works exactly the same way with impedances. Just like when you combine resistances they combine, um, uh, well, when you combine impedances, they combine just like resistances combine in parallel and in series. Uh, similar uh, to that, we have um, the voltage divider working for impedances the same way it did for resistors. So if you do the same analysis for N impedance elements and you choose So for n elements in series, um, with input V, um, I'll say Vs, and output element K we can say that the voltage across the kth element is equal to the 
the impedance of the kth element divided by the sum of all the other impedances. Z1 plus Z2 plus all the way up to ZK plus all the way up to ZN times VS. So pretty fun. Same thing, right? Same for resistors. You can have more than two. You can have ten series elements and the voltage divides up in the same way. Okay, so ZK being the output. So we, we've also looked at this as, and called this Z out and this is V out. Um, but whichever, whichever you prefer it's fine. Okay, any questions on voltage dividers? We'll do an example in a moment, but I want to introduce current dividers before we do that. So by a very similar process, we can analyze a circuit that divides current into n parallel impedance elements. So this, the, the picture we're thinking of here, when we see that is current in, so I'll call it IS to be consistent. IS and we're going to go across several impedance elements so you know whatever they are resistors, capacitors, inductors doesn't matter um, So this is the picture we're thinking of. We've got the current going through the kth one. So I'll, I'll rewrite. I'll rewrite this. So for n elements, in parallel with current source IS um, and output um, uh, elements K, we have that the current through the kth element is equal to 1 over the impedance of the kth element divided by 1 over the impedance of the first element plus 1 over the impedance of the second element plus up to 1 over the impedance of the kth element plus up to 1 over the impedance of the nth element. Times the input current. Okay, so this sort of uh, dual relationship there. Now we're ready to use it. So let's do an example. So given the circuit shown with the voltage source given in phasor form. So if it's given in phasor form, we know it's a sinusoid, right? We'll just assume it's a cosine uh, convention phasor. It's not mentioned. Um, but it's not a big deal in any case. Um, if the if the source is given in terms of the a phaser, then typically, unless it's asked for in terms of trig uh, re representation, then we'll um, give the answer in terms of a phaser, which is fine. Um, cool. So if this is the source, if it's sinusoid, um, and the output is the voltage across the inductor L. What is the ratio of the output 
over the input amplitude. And then also, what is the phase shift from input to output? So, we could go through the entire circuit analysis, right? But I would encourage us to recognize that we're close to a voltage divider here. And if we just combine these two impedances, then we have a voltage divider, right? And the concern we might have is if we do that, do we still have access to the voltage across the inductor? If we combine these two impedances, um, we'll lose the current through each inductor, but since they're in parallel, uh, the voltage across them is the same, right? So we don't lose the voltage across them, and we can combine them in parallel and then apply the voltage divider representation. So the impedance, the equivalent impedance of that uh, uh, parallel combination of a capacitor and an inductor is the impedance of the capacitor times the impedance of the inductor divided by the impedance of the capacitor times the impedance or plus the impedance of the inductor right so if that's our equivalent impedance we can just apply our divider right so we know that VL so we know that VL is equal to that equivalent impedance so ZC ZL divided by ZC plus ZL and then we've got that impedance again, ZC, ZL, divided by ah, ZC plus ZL. And then we have to add the other impedance that's in series with it. So what's the other impedance? R. Yeah, so ZR will do now. It will, we know it's R, right? So the impedance of the resistor. And then the voltage divider tells us that it's the S. So we've got the output voltage already, right? We don't have it in a simplified form yet, but the voltage divider let us skip kind of a lot of analysis and so I, I do encourage you um, unless I I almost I can't imagine that I would do it I, I'm, I don't think I would say like don't use the voltage divider rule on a given problem um, whenever you see it apply it right it's gonna help immensely in terms of how much time you spend on a problem so you can do it in your homework you can do it on an exam you see a voltage divider um, and that could be the difference between, you know, um, finishing the exam and, and not. So, yeah. It's important to, to apply it when you see it. So, if we multiply the numerator and denominator of this by ZC plus ZL, we get a little bit of a simpler expression, right? ZC, ZL divided by... ZC, ZL, plus ZR, ZC, plus ZR, ZL, times VS. Now, I think this is probably as simple as we're going to get it until we uh, uh, substitute in the impedances. Okay, so should we, when we substitute, we should use phasor form for all of them, right? 
because we're going to be multiplying all of them. So you should probably use phasor form. Um, so we've got so ZCZL in the numerator. So what's the phasor form of ZC? Excellent. And for the inductor, omega L e to the j pi over 2. And we have the same exact expression down here, right? Because we have ZCZL again. Plus, and now ZR, ZC. So R is just, ZR is just R, right? Um, we could write E to the J0, but that's just one. So R, and then ZC is 1 over omega C, E to the minus J pi over 2. And then our ZRZL is R L omega E to the J pi over 2. Uh, this one's positive, right? Because it's the impedance of the inductor. Um, if the, it was the, the capacitor one has negative, the inductor one has positive. So we can combine, uh, we can, I'm going to, when I first did this problem in my notes, the reason that this ends right there is that I skipped some steps in each, or I did a few steps in each line, but I'll, I'll go slowly because I think it, we're still learning this. Uh, here? Um, you are correct. Yes, exactly. This should be a positive. Good catch. Yeah, and it's really easy to mess this up. <laughs> it's a lot of steps. Okay, so, and what's nice is that these these terms actually simplify pretty well. So the omegas cancel, and we get left with e to the 0, right? So uh, L over C L over C, and then e to the j 0, and L over C e to the j0. Um, these ones don't really simplify, do they? Um, uh, but, but let's do... Um, uh, we'll, we'll write this out. We'll do multiple steps. So plus r over omega c e to the minus j pi over 2 Uh, plus R L omega e to the j pi over 2. Um, oh, we forgot to plug in Vs in this last problem, the last step, didn't we? So Vs is missing. What was Vs in phasor form? Yep, exactly. So we still have that. Good. Now we're going to sum the denominator terms, right? So we should probably switch from polar form, phasor form, to rectangular form of the complex number, right? That's easier to sum. 
So let's rewrite the numerator. Still L over C, E to the J zero. The denominator now, we're going to convert each of these terms into rectangular form. And uh, we can go back to our equations that the real part is the magnitude times cosine of the phase, and the imaginary part is the, uh, uh, the magnitude times the sine of the phase. But I think it's a little bit, a little bit nicer, a little bit easier to use uh, our complex plane from which those trigon trigonometric um, identities in terms of cosine and sine were derived, right? So if we go back to our complex plane, uh, we're looking at really nice angles here. Zero, a zero angle along the real axis, and then imaginary axis. Uh, and negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So L over C is completely in the whoop, completely in the real axis direction, right? It's right here. Um, and it has no angle. So what is the real part of that phaser? Yeah, everything. So L over C is the real part, and 0 is the imaginary part. So it's just L over C plus J0, so we'll just leave off the plus J0. And then uh, the second term, we have uh, an angle of negative pi over 2. So that's this angle, right? Negative pi over 2. And so it has magnitude r over omega c. It's all in the negative pi over 2 direction. So what's the real part? Zero. Yeah. So the real part is zero. Cosine of negative pi over 2 is zero. You could think of it as, as being that as well. Um, and we're left uh, just with a, a, uh, an imaginary part. The imaginary part is all is negative, right? Negative, so minus j r over omega c. And then we've got this last term, uh, which is vertical, right? So positive pi over 2. Fancy one. Positive pi over 2. And it has a real part that's zero as well, right? So its real part is zero. And its imaginary part is all of it, right? So RL omega, and it's positive this time, RL omega. So you can combine, so we're getting a little, a little bit shorter now, um, still times E a e to the j phi. So now we can, oh, I forgot my j here, right? j r l omega, all in the imaginary direction. So now we can combine our two, uh, well, all of our complex terms. We could sum them easily. So the real parts add, the imaginary parts add. So I'm left with L over C, E to the J, 0. Um, L over C is the only real part, right? Plus J, the imaginary part is, I'm going to switch the sides here. So R, L, omega, and then I'm going to move the other one, minus R over omega C. I did that because I didn't want to write a plus sign. <laughs> uh, that's, and that's all for that. Okay, so now you've got one rectangular complex number in the denominator and we can 
convert that back to polar or phasor form because that's what we need in order to divide the numerator and denominator, right? So uh, take the denominator and make it into a phasor, which I strongly encourage you to just say, oh, well, it's it's some magnitude. Um, when they're easy, the magnitudes are easy, um, it's worth just writing it in. But when they're more complex than that, uh, then it's, it's best not to write it out in detail. So m1 e to the j, uh, I'll call it psi1. Um, e to the j psi1. Um, and I didn't need to draw such a big fraction. A e to the j phi. Where we're going to define, so define our m1 to be the square root of what? Exactly, so real part is L over R squared plus the imaginary part squared, which is R L omega minus R over omega C squared. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, R L omega minus R of omega C. Is that not the imaginary part? No, for the real part under the square root, square root of L over R. Oh, L over C. Yeah. I haven't drank enough coffee. Yeah, I should drink some more. Mm -hmm. There we go. Now I won't make mistakes. <laughs> I was lying before, but now I'm not. Two drinks is enough. Arctangent of the imaginary over the real, right? So, fraction is R L omega minus R over omega C and L over C. Sweet. So those can be simplified a little bit, but I don't think it's worth it um, this time through. So let's just go forward with what we've got now. So uh, our magnitude that's combined between the numerator and denominator is L over CM1, right? And the phase is 0 minus psi 1, or just negative j psi, psi 1. Uh, and we still have our input phaser, a e to the j phi. Finally, we've got uh, the magnitudes multiplying, so LA over CM1, E to the J, phi minus psi 1. So that's our... That's well. Actually, we didn't. We we're asked for VL technically, so that's part of our answer. But we were asked for the amplitude ratio and the phase difference. So the amplitude ratio of the output amplitude over the input amplitude is. L 
A over C M one divided by the input amplitude, which is A, right? So I'm just gonna say multiply by one over A, because I wanna write a monster fraction. The A's cancel. So our ratio is just L over C M one. So that that's one of our answers. Yeah, output over the input. And that's also what you're doing in your homework too, right? You're finding the output amplitude over the input amplitude. And that doesn't matter about any phase changes at all? The amplitude does not. The, the, uh, the phase now, we also want to find the phase difference, right? So the phase difference, the input phase was phi, right? And then the phase difference is going to be minus the output phase, which was phi minus psi 1. So the phase difference, the phi's are gone. Uh, wait a minute. We want output minus input, not input minus output. So the output was phi minus psi 1, right? And then we want to subtract out the input, which is phi. So we're left with minus psi 1. So the phase shift was negative psi 1 from the input to the output. For phase difference, you take the output and you subtract the input. For the amplitude ratio, you take the output and you divide by the input. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. I might. Um,